Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 58. This week, we take a look at the top 10 board games that need to be apps. Our at the table includes Keyflower, Yido, Rococo, Concordia, and Daniel takes a look at the Cleric class in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Daniel. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. We're so glad to have you join us here this week. This episode, we're going to talk about our favorite games that absolutely, positively must become apps. Now, we have a special criteria from this, so don't worry. It's not just like, every game needs to be an app, because honestly... Having played a lot of board games on app devices, I can surely tell you that there are plenty of games out there that absolutely positively should not be apps. We combed through the list, picked out the best games that would play well on a tablet or an iPhone or some sort of Microsoft device, which some people tend to use. Or an Android device, (laughs) which good people tend to use. Moral people. (laughs) What are you trying to say? You don't want to be be part of the iPhone cult like the rest of us? Good lord, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, nonetheless, we, we pulled together the list, we pulled together the best, and we're going to bring it to you, and hopefully, just hopefully, those board game publishers are listening to us, and they will get those games out on app formats. That being said, let's get on to Shout It From The Tabletop. Shout It From The Tabletops. <laughs> Sir, you're going to need to get down from there. All right, so shouting it from the tabletop this week. First off, we wanted to talk about Board Gamers Anonymous attendance at Dreamation. Now, this is an outstanding little board game convention that happens in Morristown, New Jersey, and it'll be happening this week. So when you're listening to the podcast, this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we'll be having a four-day event, playing board games, there'll be RPGs, there'll be LARPing, there'll be cake and candy and ice cream for all the good boys and girls out there. And actually, that's a thing. They're actually going to have chocolate fountains and ice cream things and I guess plenty, plenty of sugar to go around, if not many, many, many caffeinated types of drinks. Lord, I already feel nauseated. (laughs) That's super sweet, too. It seems seems like a Willy Wonka of board gaming. We'll show up there, and then not all of us will make it back, but we'll die in a very happy and thematic type of way, or Euro type of way, if you want to take it that way. Crushed by giant dice. (laughs) I don't know, though. It looks like it's really going to be a lot of fun. This is my first board gaming convention, so I'm excited to be going out there, and they look like they've got a great list of events and a great crowd in general, so... Hopefully I'll get to see you there. Yeah, and just beyond being a spectator, because we're there just to enjoy like everybody else, we really want to take part of as many board games as we can. So there's going to be things like Seven Wonders and First and Goal and Alien Frontiers and Among the Stars and Amon Ray and Apocalypse Z and Apples to Apples and Arkham Horror. Just There's an endless number of games that are going to be available that you can pre-register for sit down and be able to play with a number of people and some teachers there. So if you are in the New Jersey area or somewhere local or you want to have a great time at a great convention, please check out Double Exposures Convention Dreamation 2015, Thursday, February 19th to Sunday, February 22nd, 2015. You're going to have a great time and hopefully we'll get to see you there. So two bits of news that are actually related to our topic today. Uh, The first is the Seven Wonders app, which seemed to have gone the way of Vaporware, has actually resurfaced. So there has been some playthrough footage shown, that sort of thing. So it looks like the Seven Wonders app is still on the rails and still coming down the line for us. And that was a lot of weird mixed metaphor kind of... Well, no, coming down the line is also a railroad metaphor. I'm just really hitting the railroad metaphors today. <laughs> uh, well, like a, board, a good board gamer does, right? Because right. most of the board games out there are railroad-based anyway. Gotta so. stay on theme, right? You gotta <laughs> stay on theme in every way. Uh, and then something a little bit nearer and dearer to my heart 
is that Dungeons & Dragons has announced another foray into the video game world, which isn't too noteworthy in of itself. They've done a couple video games, and most role-playing games are sort of based off of a D&D world system anyway. Uh, but this one, Sword Coast Legends, uh, promises to be relatively unique in that it allows players to take an at-the-table DM role. That is, you get to become the dungeon master, coordinate the various enemy groups, lay traps, provide treasure and rewards and punishments and all of that sort of things that really only a human DM can do in the flexible sort of way that makes role-playing as special as it is. So hopefully, this will mark a move towards a more nuanced sort of virtual role-playing game where we can get what we really love out of the tabletop role-playing games in a virtual environment. Uh, and it looks like it's going to be pretty good. Both of the uh, teams that are associated in making it have lots of experience and you know, with Unreal Tournament, and uh, they've worked on some of the Call of Duty games, I think. It's, it's a pretty exciting project. Well, it's great to hear. I mean, we really don't have that nice connection to the digital arena where we can bring new players in. And anytime we can bring something out in order to bring out not just our traditional board game and role play game fans... But just like video game fans, just having this up wherever it's going to be on the internet, on Steam, on different platforms, really kind of brings a new player base to play. So one of the nice things about any sort of virtualized version of a board game or a tabletop game is it takes all the checkbook balancing, accounting, actuarializing, uh, calculation, and just sort of throws it out and lets the computer handle it. So hopefully this will be a way for new players to learn the rule sets, or at least the general ideas, Sure. and maybe they'll get interested in going further into traditional role-playing games. That's the real barrier for entry, because when you, when you pull out these books... It's overwhelming as someone who's not, you know, a hardcore RPG or and you're looking at it like, I don't know even what to do with this. So that would be great. Yeah, I think it's gonna be very helpful at fighting that. I mean D D five E has simplified things a lot, and this system's gonna be based on five E, so I'm excited to see how that goes. But even so, it still is a pretty intimidating prospect to jump in. Okay. So, yeah. so it doesn't replace it, it just offers it in another model. Yeah, I think so. I don't think you can ever really replace uh, face-to-face, person-to-person role-playing games mm-hmm. because no matter how good your simulation is, you still need a human to adjudicate everything. And now they're, they're not too specific on how the DMing role works right now. Okay. But unless it's a really broad system, uh, it, I can't see it fully replacing face-to-face interaction. Even then, too, there's something about hanging around with your friends, eating a pizza, and <laughs> you know, a dungeon diving together that's just you know hard to beat. There you go. All right. All right. So that's our Shout It From The Tabletop. Top, 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 top. And now, our Acquisition Disorders. Acquisition Disorders? That's crazy. Only needs the base game. Nothing else but the base game. The base game and the expansion. See? Nothing else. Just the base game and the expansion and the promos. The base game and the expansion and the promos. And, of course, the upgraded components. Why wouldn't you have the upgraded components? So the base game, the expansion, the promos, and the upgraded components. See? That's not too much. But maybe, I don't know, maybe you might need the expansion. All right. So now on to our Acquisition Disorders. So, for me, there's a lot of great board games out. And it's getting quite difficult to kind of stay off Mentor Market or Cool Stuff Inc. and just start buying literally everything. But two games that really kind of piqued my interest is, first up, Deus. Now, this game had a big release at Essen and has kind of quietly made its way around the U.S. And in particular, what's really, you know, struck people here is it's an interesting interactive Euro game that allows you to do civilization building but seems simple enough, kind of in a Sillars of Catan look at least, but it allows a more intricate, interactive type of gameplay. Now, this is a beautiful looking game, it has some nice features to it, and really what's going to bring you in at, at, at first is being able to use all their special abilities and card functions. That's You don't see that a lot of times in Euros. Usually it's just a lot of manipulation of different tracks and set collections, But having special powers and abilities really kind of sets this game apart from other ones. It's available now and it's something that you really should take a look at because I think at the end of the year, when we look back at the best games of 2015, I think this is going to be one of the top games. Uh, So Chris, you mentioned that these cards have sort of special abilities that allow you to change the game in some interesting ways. Uh, What kinds of special abilities were you talking about? So with this game, you're building a civilization as all good Euro games do. So you'll have trade, production, 
agriculture, science, and military, just like your general Seven Wonders game. What's interesting about the special abilities with these cards are, you know, usually when you play a Euro game, you play one card and it has its special ability and then it kind of goes away and like, that was really nice. But in this game, you're building a tableau and as you build a tableau and you pay the resources for the card, it actually activates the other cards as part of that section. So you'll be able to use the abilities of those other cards again and again. So as you build a civilization, it's not like Seven Wonders where you have that resource and that resource is available. You have that special ability. It activates other abilities. So you'll be able to build and to trade and to use military in a number of different ways based upon not just the tableau you build, but other cards that you play into that section. So it's nice. It gives you a reason not just to buy a card for that instantaneous effect or that one resource as a euro game tends to have but to be able to really utilize tableaus which tends to be one of my favorite features in euro games but often isn't utilized much more beyond i play a card it sits there and it does some minor benefit later on so i like that a lot that's That's really a a good feature yeah that's really cool the idea of being able to build tableau engines is always uh sort of something that interests me about a game and this sounds like it's got some potential for that by having sort of echoing effects and constant effects and i think that's really the true mark of a a good you know euro civilization game is once you developed or you found out about a science in particular it should be able to benefit you beyond just that one simple age like you don't you learn writing it still benefits you thousands of years later in just more interesting ways it's not like yes we know how to write let's never do that again Well, of course. I mean, Chris, I think I'm going to have to challenge you on that. Oh, okay. (laughs) Really, all that ever mattered was those first words written down. The rest of this was just totally useless. (laughs) None of this ever mattered. Well, they've already written. Why would you have to write any more? I mean, you kind of covered that. We were done. We're done writing, right? We're just done. All right. So another game in which you're evoking the gods in order to help you with your civilization will be Elysium. Now, this is a set collection game that uses um, combinations to... Recruit cards that represent heroes, items, powers, and gods. These cards have a lot of different powers, just like we were talking about Deus. But this one is more along the lines of, you know, creating a snowball effect where the cards are able to chain off each other and you be able to receive the help from the gods. Now, once again, being a good Euro, this is another victory point game. And each card belongs to one of the eight Olympian gods. And they have different levels. So during the five turns of the game, players will be able to transfer their cards and write their own legends as they're being able to grow and build their own power. And then the idea is to become, you know, legendary and to gain favor with the gods by your legendary status. But you'll lose power, you'll lose cards throughout the game. And so it's a sense of managing your own epic of power and ability and receiving favors from the gods. Now, there isn't too much information released about this beyond the card drafting and the set collection. But once again, this is another beautiful game. And it's nice to see that Euros are finally getting the artistic treatment they deserve. And, you know, I want to see that more. I mean, it doesn't have to be one or the other, whether it's thematic or, you know, heavy mechanics. But being able to have cards that really evoke that type of innovative artwork and really gives you a theme, is really honestly the best of both worlds, and it has some really nice iconography here. Yeah, I actually almost interrupted you by saying, oh wow, Chris just showed me a picture of some of the the cards artwork, and it is gorgeous. It is really nice. It is way nicer than I'm used to seeing from Euros, (laughs) uh, which are typically rather gray and drab. Yeah, this is a small component game. It, It doesn't have a lot of pieces to it. But it's really nice to see that the artwork and all the gods come in, in, into play here. So if you're familiar with Greek mythology at all, you'll be able to see all the different stories kind of play out in the cards. And to be able to use those is just so much fun because I love mythology. And I know a lot of gamers are kind of you know invested in Roman and Greek mythology and Norse mythology. So it's nice to see a game that really truly evokes that you know feeling of philosophy. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it's one of the more commonly used themes, right? The whole Greek pantheon, look, Zeus, Hera, all them. <laughs> but they almost never go beyond the Olympians, right? They yes. almost never go to the smaller figures. And this game has a lot of, I mean, it's got Orpheus on a card, right? Oh, it's got all these legendary figures who are significant in Greek myth and have their own rich stories, but who you never see hit the table. So it's nice to see them hit the table. Yeah, and it's nice to see that 
the legends live on and that you can still play part in that kind of historical myth. How about from you, Daniel? Anything on your acquisition disorders? Yeah, for my acquisition disorder, I'm looking at the Temple of Elemental Evil board game. Now, this is a D&D adventure board game in the line of The Legend of Drizzt and uh, Castle Ravenloft. And I really like those games, and I own Castle Ravenloft, which I got on one of the many fantastic Barnes & Noble's clearance sales, which was amazing. Uh, anyway... I like these games. They're a good low barrier to entry way to get people interested in the idea of D&D. Kind of like what we were talking about will hopefully occur with this video game when they release it. Uh, So I think it'll be a nice one to add to my collection because I am constantly trying to uh, preach the good word of tabletop role playing. And so if I get the chance to do that through a game like that, sounds good. And they're usually good games too, just independently good games. Nice. All right, so that's our acquisition disorders. Let's go on to what's hitting our table with BGA. And now, At the Table with BGA. All right, so our At the Table this week, I got some great games in here. So I'm going to talk about four games, all Euros for you this week. It's a Euro week. And I'd like to thank New Jersey Board Gamers Group for bringing these games out and having an outstanding time playing them. First off, I played Yido. Now, I had Yido for quite some time. This was a gift. And it was one of those games where you heard it was Lords of War Deep, but a little bit heavier. So I had it in the wrap, hadn't gotten a chance to play it yet. And actually, at one of the meetups, they broke it out. And I was so glad to have a chance to play this. Really like Lords of War Deep, and Yido seemed to be kind of a step up that way. And personally, I felt that Lords of War Deep was a little thin. It was a little bit light. It was still an outstanding gateway game and a good Euro game. But it definitely needed something more. Now, in Yido, some of the things are similar to Lords of War Deep. And and as I talk about this review here, I want to express my apologies to, you know, the creators of Yido. Because they've gotten a lot of this similar feedback that people have played Yido after playing Lords of War Deep. Where, in fact, Yido came out... A year before it did. And in fact, this game was developed two years before. So if anything, Lords of Waterdeep should be comparing itself and talking about itself in reference to Yido. Now, in Yido, some of this some of the same mechanics still play true like Lords of Waterdeep. So there are mission cards. Now, when you play Lords of Waterdeep, you'll get a number of these different quest cards, and in Yido you get these message cards, and in Yido you will have these green mission cards, which are the easy missions. Yellow, a little difficult. Red, much more difficult. And black, which are the most difficult in the game. Now, the board is beautiful. The artwork is beautiful. It has a lot of theme in the game, a lot of flavor text, a lot of fluff going into it. Now, the mission cards are going to tell you exactly what you need in order to complete the mission. Now, I should say, right from the start, these missions aren't nice, happy missions. These are kind of like dark and grimy. And, you know, these are kidnappings and theft and a lot of bad stuff that's kind of going on in this age. So you're, what you need to do is send your disciples to different parts of the city. And once they're in the city, in order to complete the mission, they will need a number of different things. So there are geisha that you can hire. There are special rooms which you can add to your tableau that will give you a passive ability. And you can also place one of your disciples there to activate a special ability there'll be weapons which you'll be able to purchase from a market to add to your tableau and i should mention here that both the geisha and the weapons unlike lords of water deep once you use them in a mission they stay with you now this is nice because you can actually build up a pretty extensive tableau which will benefit you throughout the game so there really isn't a loss if you happen to take Um, certain resources early on and then not be able to use them later they're usable throughout the game and especially where the weapons and the geisha you'll be able to trade them throughout the game now once again there's some problems and a little dark imagery here so the geisha you can pick up early in the game and I'll talk about that mechanic in a second but you can also pick them up in literally the red light district so there is a little problematic you know theming here which is true to the age But nonetheless, once again, not really needed here. You didn't have to be able to hire these geisha from the red light district. Come on, guys. It didn't have to be that literal. But nonetheless, beyond that, you'll be able to pick up um, special final mission cards that will be able to give you bonus victory points. There are action cards in this game that do a whole number of different things 
from messing other people up to giving you special abilities. And the game is about completing these missions. Beyond completing those missions, there are one or two spots on the board where you can get victory points. Now, the board itself is beautiful. It depicts all the different areas that you can go to. It has a central area where there will be a guard patrol. If the guard moves to the area where you had one of your disciples, they get arrested. So you want to make sure not to have your disciple in that area. Now, as I said earlier, there's some action cards that mess up other players. So it's possible to use an action card to safeguard yourself or hurt somebody else. Not to worry because at the start of the game you get these blackmail cards. So you can use a blackmail card, which does count as victory points at the end of the game, to be able to move that guard away from you for the time being. But nonetheless, you're losing some victory points there. Now, beyond all those different things that you'll be able to pick up, it's a standard worker placement game. You'll be placing your disciples a la your workers here. You'll be able to use certain spots on the boards for special abilities and pick up special things such as blessings. And you'll be able to pick up weapons and, as we said, geishas and things like that. The game is longer than Lords of Waterdeep. It's more complex than Lords of Waterdeep. It has some trading that Lords of Waterdeep does not have. It has a market slash auction mechanic to begin with. So before you get to place your disciples in the game, you'll be auctioning slash bidding on certain spots. So for cards, for weapons, for rooms, for geishas, for additional workers, and for missions, they'll come at a cheaper cost unless someone outbids you. So the game's fun. The game's interesting. It's a little bit long, and I don't know if that takes away the fun because after I got two games played of this in... Players were not, you know, really interested in getting another out. So maybe these kind of overall mechanics should be in a shorter game like Lords of Waterdeep. But what Yedo does, it does very well. So I own this game. It's a play. I think I will play it in the future. But I'm a little interested to see if other players will be able to play a game that plays, let's say, two to three hours Whereas Lord of Waterdeep plays maybe an hour, an hour and a half. So, and I think that's the problem Lords of Waterdeep had initially was it was too light. Yido is too long. We need to find something right in the middle. But uh, Yido is a play, and uh, if you get a chance to play it, you should check it out. All right, so we're looking for Lords of Yido Deep. <laughs> there you uh, go. That's our goal point. That's if, where we're headed. If Drew was here, he would work out a mashup. Yeah. Now, I got a chance to play another... Um, famous Euro, Keyflower. Now, Keyflower is kind of in the Carcassonne universe. So if you've ever seen Carcassonne, you get an idea of what the game's going to look like. The same colored meeples, the same colored hexagons, but it plays very different. Now, just like Yido, you're going to have this little bit of a marketplace where you'll have these hex tiles placed out in front of you, but instead of having a certain color of meeple, what you will do will draw meeples from a bag And then on your turn, you'll be able to place a meeple of a certain color either on the tile to activate its special ability or next to the tile as a bidding mechanic. And at the end of the round, if you have the most of that color meeple that's bidding for that title, you win that title along with any meeples that was on that hex tile in order to activate it. So you add it to your tableau. But once you add it to your tableau, or another player adds a tile to their tableau, it doesn't mean it's it's off the board. You can still use your meeple, just a regular meeple, to activate their tile. Now, you got to be careful because when you do that, they're going to get your meeple for their pool of meeples to be able to use later on. There are also a lot of special abilities on each of these tiles. Now, it's a general kind of civilization kind of building game, so... You're producing resources, you're shipping resources around the board, you're scoring victory points based upon those resources, and there are some tiles that allow you to do some things that kind of break the rules a little bit. So you remember when I said that you had to have a meeple in order to bid and then someone else had the same color meeple? Well, there's a tile that breaks that. So like every good game, there's always a tile that breaks that. Now, how you set the tableau up by placing the hexagons will matter because there are some tiles that will allow you to score victory points depending on how things are laid out. But what's really interesting about this game is it follows the season. So there's a spring, summer, fall, and winter. On the winter phase, you will take a look at three tiles that you were given. If it's a two-player game, if it's more, you have more tiles. You will choose which tiles to put in play. 
So you want to put tiles into play that you've built towards. So one of the tiles, for example, might benefit off having certain resources and you put that tile into play and now everyone bids and then it's able to activate those tiles just like a regular round. But being able to choose what tiles come into play gives a little more of a strategic advantage because you can build towards those final tiles. It's a fun game. It's more of the lighter style, but it's a solid Euro game. It's heavier than Carcassonne. It's a lot of fun. It plays with a lot of players, which I think is surprising for a Euro game. You get these little kind of paper shields that kind of hide the number of meeples and the colors of meeples that you have. But if you see Keyflower, go out and play it. And honestly, it's worth a buy. It's a little vanilla in its presentation, but it's still worth a buy just for the mechanics alone. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a lot of flexible play options there, which is sometimes hard to find in games like that. So that sounds pretty exciting. Yeah. Another game, and yet another Euro game I got a chance to play, was Concordia. Now, Concordia is a little bit challenging to talk about because what's involved here is at least on one side of the board, you have Europe. On the other side of the board, you have Italy. And what you're doing in this game is you have a set of cards, and each of the cards have different actions. When you play a card, you'll be able to play an action that will do a number of different things. Once again, it's a, it's a classic Euro, so you're taking over certain areas. Think Power Grid. You know how like in Power Grid, there are certain cities, and if you place your um, building on that city, you'll be able to kind of have an area control mechanic, and you have to pay a certain amount of money. But then once someone else is there, and you go there after, it costs more. So you're building these kind of routes. You're, you're controlling these cities in that Power Grid type of mechanic. You're playing action cards like Mission Red Planet where each one has a special ability and you can play a card that recalls all those cards but then you can't do anything that round. So it's a lot of fun as far as that's concerned. It looks a little bland. Once again, it's a Euro game. We understand this. And the box art also looks a little bit bland. So you're like, "Eh, I don't know if I want to play this. But once you open it up, you lay out the board. It's beautiful. It has this kind of like antique look to it. And beyond the original cards that you have to play certain actions, you can purchase additional cards, which will give you bonus points. It'll give you extra building actions to build more buildings, to expand your roots, and you will score points based upon the cards that you have into play. It has a a bit of a random setup, so each of the different areas in in this Europe or Italy civilization will be able to you know, host certain number of goods, export these certain goods. So every game won't be the same because every city will have a randomly generated resource. And based upon where you go, you'll be able to score that resource. So it's a fun game. Once again, definitely a play. I don't know if it's a buy because it plays a little bit long and it's a little mechanical, at least in the way it plays. It doesn't really have a lot of theme to it, but I can certainly see you picking up this game Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to put this head-to-head with Power Grid, given how similar they seem to be in a lot of ways. So maybe we should uh, talk about that later. Yeah, a nice uh, head-to-head versus versus. on the front. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, another game that I got a chance to play, because we're all Euro this week, was Rococo. Now, Rococo's quite an interesting game. It's similar to Concordia in the way that you're going to get a certain hand of cards that are going to have special abilities... And it has a deck building mechanic in a way where, just like Concordia, you'll be able to purchase additional cards that will give you special abilities throughout the game. But here's the thing that's really unique. You get to play only three cards to start with. So let's say when you start the game, you get five cards. You pick which three cards you want to play. You have to put the other two cards face down. You will not be able to play those two cards. So you have to be really sure what you're going to do that round. But since you're able to purchase other cards, you can extend your play. Now, the marketplace for purchasing those cards is as such. The first person to purchase a card has to pay five, and then it goes down steadily until the last card is cost zero to purchase. Now, you're purchasing those cards to be able to use actions, which do a number of different things, but also the special ability on the card that may benefit you now or may benefit you later in the game. Also, you'll be able to sell those special ability cards. Let's say they're the Master, the Apprentice, and such. You can sell those cards for money that will benefit you in the game. Now, beyond that card 
hand management system, what you're doing in Rococo is you're making dresses. And that's awesome. So it has that kind of classic Euro game mechanic. And it's, you know, a Louis the Fifteenth type of game during his era where you're making these dresses, you're hiring musicians, you're setting off fireworks. It's a lovely, fancy time for the bourgeoisie, right? So it also, this game, has a mechanic from Fresco where you're going to the marketplace and you're purchasing different fabrics, different colors. So there's red, yellow, green, and blue. You're purchasing those. You're holding them aside. Then you're going over to another marketplace where, just like suburbia, there's this linear marketplace. The two, the two all the way to the left are free, and then it gets more expensive as you move up the track. But eventually those will move down the track. You pick the dress. You provide the fabric for the dress. It might require lace or it might require thread, which is another resource that you get throughout the game. And then once you're able to create that dress, you can then sell it for money or place it in this beautiful palace where it has all these different levels to it. And depending where you place it in this palace, it is an area control game now. So if you have the most dresses in that area, you control that area and score the victory points. And then there's a number of other ways. There's a little bit of a point salad where if you have a dress in each area, you'll score victory points. If you have dresses on the top floor and you purchase a special bonus, they go on to the top level and they enjoy the fireworks and you score extra points and there's fountains. There's a lot of ways to score victory points in this game. But basically, you're purchasing materials to make dresses to sell for money or score for victory points. It's a fun game. It's definitely a play, and I'm going to say, it's a buy. This is something that it's deceptively simple, but a lot of fun to play. Yeah, I mean, putting Fresco, Suburbia, and all these mechanics together, this is, it sounds really good to me. I mean, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to play it with you, but I'd, I'd like to give it a shot. Yeah, I think it plays, it's a little bit lighter in a way to, let's say, Concordia, which is a little bit heavier, at least in looks. I think that Rococo has some interesting tactical choices that you're making throughout the game. So what determines order for going to the market? So when you start the game, you're going to pick a random person, but there is a queen that you can purchase as part of one of your actions. Then you would become the first player. Now, when you go to the market, whether it's to purchase an additional character or or to purchase fabric... You can purchase from anywhere in this little marketplace, but if you're the first person going to that area, it's going to cost you more and then less and less and less. So there's a first player marker type of mechanic there. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I was really surprised. I like the look of this game um, because it's, you know, creating dresses and putting them in a palace. It might attract a wider range of people. And it has that nice balance between being just heavy enough for hardcore gamers and just light enough to get someone to sit down and play, that I think it's going to bring in a lot of people. So that's Rococo. you got to check that game out. We have learned about Chris's secret passion for fashion here. (laughs) I am exposed, but it's fine, because I have three green fabric and four red fabric, and it's going to be fabulous. All right, guys, well, you might have noticed I was being pretty quiet during the At the Table segment, and uh, I'd been planning on talking about D&D experiences on the At the Table segments, but we've decided that with D&D 5.0 coming out and with all this interesting stuff happening in role-playing games, and since role-playing games, uh, particularly tabletop role-playing games, are my true love, uh, that it's worth breaking off into a new segment for this. So we're going to try this out for a little while. Uh, the segment is called Analyze the Dweamer. Uh, those of you who've played 3rd edition or 3.5 D&D will recognize the name of that, which is a spell that helps you understand all the magical effects in an area. And uh, yeah, so we're just going to talk about role-playing games, analyze them as though they were dweamers, uh, and talk about what we like, what we don't, Uh, And significant changes. So right now what we're going to do is continue what I did, I think, two episodes ago where I talked about playing to the Warlock. I'm going to just sort of explore each class in 5th edition once a week. Uh, One one for each week and analyze the Dreamer. Uh, So the one I'm going to talk about now is the Cleric because I had a good chance to get to play the Cleric some. Uh, Particularly I'm playing the Cleric of Life. Uh, And 
you know, this is the straight up super healer cleric, right? This is the one that embraces the clericy goodness and decides no one shall bleed while I stand kind of thing. The Cleric of Life is an interesting domain. You get a bonus proficiency in heavy armor. Uh, you get a perfect domain list. You get Bless, Cure, Wounds, Lesser Restoration, these sort of things, right? Straight up the alley. Things that every cleric should have prepared every day. So the fact that you don't have to prepare them is really nice and frees up your spellbook a lot. Or not spellbook, I guess. Your divine bank a lot. Uh, and then you get all this sort of amplified healing effects that you'd expect from this. Uh, the Cleric Spell List in 5e is pretty good, though narrow-ish in the early levels, especially if you have a high Wisdom Cleric. So I've got a, an 18 Wisdom Cleric at level 3, which means that more of my spell preparation is coming from my Wisdom than my Cleric level. And so I'm sort of overwhelming the number of spells they might have anticipated me being able to prepare. Uh, so I ended up preparing a lot of spells that were just sort of, well, maybe this will be relevant. <laughs> so far, I've only used... Uh, the uh, spiritual weapon. That's just the only thing I've used. Just go kill everyone. I'll be over here. You you keep hitting things. Uh, <laughs> and then packed up a few people, as, of course. It's really hard to be the healer in a group. I, I like playing the healer. It kind of fits my style. Um, I really enjoy it, but man, you never really get the respect for being a healer. You know, you're just like, oh, and then we have a healer. He's going to be over there. And, but you have to have a healer, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it. you can try to survive without a healer, especially in a high magic setting where you just have healing potion bandoliers and stuff. <laughs> but it's you have to do some, some tricky movement to make that work. Healers are, I think, absolutely vital. And it's how the game is supposed to play. Sure. Uh, one thing that's really nice about healers in this version is the with the heavy armor proficiency, and then at 6th level you get this thing called Blessed Healer, which you heal yourself when you heal other people. So the Cleric of Life, if you want to play them this way, can march into the middle of the battlefield and just throw down as a front-to-midline fighter Mm -hmm. who can also heal, um, at least at lower levels. So the healer can be a little bit more active in this case. You can always also cast Sanctuary and just be immortal while you cast buffs on your friends, but, you know, that's another way to play. You can't attack people if you do that or else the Sanctuary spell will drop and your opponents can hit you. But the biggest change, the biggest thing that caught me, I mean, so there's all this flexibility with preparation now, which is nice. So you prepare a set of spells and you cast from a pool, but you don't have to cast as you prepared, right? So it used to be you had like, I have one, cure wounds, and two, right, sanctuaries, what have you. Um, Now it's just sort of, here's the things I've got today. I'll cast whatever I feel like as long as it's of the right level. Um, But the biggest thing that got me uh, is that we were in a crypt full of the undead. And as a cleric of life, right, a healing cleric, I am so used to the idea that I should just be able to raise my holy symbol and say the light of the sun burns the shadows and they should just disintegrate, right? Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. But in 5th edition, healing spells have no effect on the undead whatsoever. That is wrong, man. That is wrong. Well, and it's an, an, an interesting move. Um, if interesting you mean wrong, then yeah, fine. <laughs> but the idea is, right, so as you said, every party needs a healer. Almost everyone brings in a cleric with them. Sure. And if you encounter a group of undead with a cleric in your party, what happens to that group of undead? They get a TV show and they become uh, <laughs> go on to be a phenomenon? They die horribly. Again. But they're already dead! They re-die. Um, <laughs> very quickly, right? This is where you get things like the Radiant Servant of Paylor, who was a, which is a prestige class from 3-5, which was super healer, and got to the point that instead of turning undead, they just, like, explode into fireballs all around you and stuff. I don't see the problem with that. Well, the problem is that undead become unintimidating, right? So if your vampire lord can be taken down by a cleric just going, BE HEALED! And their head explodes... That's not so much, you know, bite as you'd like a vampire to have. Oh, ho, ho. Uh, so by taking that away, they've taken one of the party's most significant weapons against the undead out. Okay. And I think that's nice because it makes the undead scary again. I used to never be afraid of the undead if we had a cleric because the clerics just wiped them out. And any undead that was powerful enough to threaten the cleric would be overwhelmingly dangerous if the cleric got dropped somehow, right? If you planned for the cleric to be there and the cleric got dropped, 
it's just game over because yeah. now they, they're missing their big cannon here. Uh, so it balances in a really interesting way. It makes it so the cleric isn't that much more effective than other players against the undead, which I appreciate because it gives everyone a chance to shine in the battle against the undead. And it kind of evens out the cleric's utility because otherwise it's like, I'm a healer, I'm a healer, I'm a healer. Oh, wait, there's undead in the room? Everyone stand back. I got this. Right? Just, where did that come from? Why are you now the single most significant person in we're all just standing on the sidelines going, go, clear, go. <laughs> uh, so I think that it was a good move. And it also, you know, it gets rid of uh, something that 5 E's tried to get rid of a lot of cases, which are all these special exceptions for things, right? This doesn't do sure. much except for when it hits these guys and then these guys burst into flame and die. Sure. Um, so it's, uh, it's been an interesting move to do that. Uh, you only get one turn on dead attempt too, and then they just run from you. Which, you know, that's what turn on dead kind of does, but... I was like, oh, but if they run, then I have to go catch them to kill them. And that just sounds like a lot of effort. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so I think the Cleric is a really interesting class. Uh, it's kept up a lot of what made it good. There is a forewarning that if you like to play Clerics because they can whoop the undead, that is not really true anymore. They are still gifted fighting the undead. They do still have their turn undead powers, but... As a rule, just because you can heal does not mean you can kill all the undead, right? You can't just purge the darkness with the inner light of your soul. So that's, so that's uh, definitely something to keep in, keep in mind. But I am one of the strongest fighters in our group, so that's kind of weird. <laughs> I rolled the weirdest stats. I have 18 con and 18 wisdom. And I rolled these stats. Mm-hmm. And 9 charisma and 9 dexterity... So wow. I've got like two nines and two eighteens. Jeez. And so I'm almost impossible to kill, and I can see anything coming for miles and miles and miles around, apparently. But I'm not too, you know, dexter agile. And uh you don't want to look at my face, apparently. It's not such a pretty face, not such a <laughs> I was like, if you guys could, you know, maybe worship God, that'd be great. I don't I don't know. Just be like, it's cool. It's a good, yeah. It's a good guy. He's probably not very good at giving sermons, I have to imagine. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so that's 5e Cleric. It's a good class. Something I highly suggest trying out. I really like the life domain. That added armor bonus really lets you get in there. The healing of powers let you be an asset on the field. And there are a couple of spells you can throw around to sort of link your life to someone else. Sure. So you can take half of their damage. Oh, cool. And a sort of hack that you can do... Not a hack. This is obviously intended. But a thing you can do with a, as a life cleric, since when you heal other people, you heal yourself. Mm-hmm. If you split the damage between two people and then you heal the other person and yourself, you're getting sort of a double dip with your healing powers. Nice. So you can heal really efficiency, efficiently as a life domain cleric and really get into the midst of things and, and mix things up with your fighter, with your stronger fi- uh, friends and help in a more active way. So, you know, as you pointed out, sometimes clerics get sort of put on the sideline and people don't really recognize what they're doing. Uh, it's hard to be cynical about that, though, when you've got your cleric in heavy armor with a mace and a shield sure, running down, beating people's heads in. Uh, yeah, it's a good class. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that they're in D and D in a real significant type of way, and that their nerfing hasn't, you know, completely made them useless. Because that happens a lot of times too, where it's like, "Hey, we see a problem. Let's just make him completely useless and untenable in any type of way." So, yeah, it's interesting. It's you know, they took some of the stuff away, but they also gave some other stuff back. The domains, I think, are uh, way cooler in this edition than they have been in the past, and way more effective. Uh, and I think that clerics keep pace with other sorts of class in damage output better than they have in the past. I'm not sure about that. I'd have to really sit down and crunch numbers. Mm-hmm. But running my cleric next to our two fighters, and albeit they're third level fighters, right? So maybe they <laughs> haven't really grown into themselves yet. But my cleric has been keeping up. Right? Okay. And he's been hurt less, hitting harder. So I'm pretty happy with the way they've made the cleric move. And more towards the active and less conditional, right? If your cleric really relies on there being undead to fight to be useful, sure. that's super contingent and super narrow. And it also means that every time the undead show up, everyone else is going to go, oh, all right, we're just going to get something to eat. And it's probably boring for a DM, too. Mm-hmm. And I've seen a lot of DMs who, when there's a high-powered cleric, they just won't throw undead in. They're just like, oh, I don't... Yeah. This is I know what's gonna happen. The cleric's gonna grab their face and quote unquote <laughs> heal them until they explode like a you know dying star. 
And it's just, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. It's a good class. Try it out. Try 5th edition. And uh, I think next week I'll probably be talking about Paladins. Okay. We'll that's going to be interesting, because I know that some, when Paladins kind of popped up as a major class, yeah. Clerics kind of, kind of got brushed aside. Yeah, and with the Clerics getting more active in combat, uh, or at least my Cleric getting more active in combat, and with there being... And my Cleric's a healer Cleric, not the War Domain or the Tempest Domain who can sure. like, shoot lightning bolts and crap. <laughs> um, it'll be interesting to see where the Paladin falls down, and, you know, but it'll be cool. Stick with the Holy Men for now. Well... One unholy man, the warlock, now a holy man, and back to another holy man for the paladin. So that'll probably where we'll go next week. So tune in next week for my discussion of the paladin. <laughs> there you go. All right, Daniel, we'll look forward to that. Yeah. And now our top ten list. All right, so this week's feature is the top 10 board games that need to be apps. They need to be on our tablets, on our phones, on our... What are those devices that you use that no one really buys, but somehow they still are around? It's also a phone. It's a phone? It's called a droid. (laughs) It's got a pretty significant market share, actually. Thank you very much. If you say so, uh, I don't know. All right. It's not a, it's not a Zoom, for the love of God. <laughs> well, they're both kind of window-based, right? So. No, Droid is Google. <laughs> All right. And the Android apps that sometimes people buy and stuff like that. Yeah, if anyone makes these games and then makes them iOS exclusive, I will be furious at you. <laughs> Just prefacing that, prefacing that. It's all right. You're a cleric. You would never hurt a unarmed app executive, right? Well, next week I'll be a paladin, so I will smite their evil. <laughs> so we want to talk a little bit about a rubric, a sense and a rule set and an overarching theme for this top ten list. Because, you know, when we love board games, we want to have them everywhere. We want to have posters. We want them on our tablets. We want them on our computers. We want them everywhere. But... As probably many of you know out there, there are some games that kind of work better than an app than others. So we really want to bring you the ones that we believe would probably be the top 10 board games that absolutely need an app for specific reasons. First, obviously, that they would play well on an app. Second, because as a board game, there's something that's just not you know complete or something that an app can do for the board game that is maybe missing. And I should also say, too, this this list is not about the top 10 apps for board games because there are a lot of those that are companions that help a board game along. These are games. These are games that need to be on an app format. All right. So that being said, let's get started. So my first choice here is going to be a Euro because for me this week, it's all about the Euros. I'm going to go with Stefan Fell's Trajan. Now, Trajan is an outstanding game. It's often thought of as Stefan Fell's kind of quintessential Euro game. If you talk about Trajan, you're talking about point salads, you're talking about a lot of fiddly little pieces, and for me, that's really where Trajan breaks down a little bit. It, it has such a big setup time, it has a lot of randomization as far as where all the chits go, how to set them up, how to move in all these different areas, and honestly... Trajan is like a lot of little mini games on one board. You're going to the market. You're going to the military. You're going to the Senate. You're you're uh, you're doing a lot of things, and it takes so much time to set up and break down, and it takes so much time to kind of manage all those different shits. Now, a board game app version of this would be outstanding because you could, on the app or even on your phone, be able to pick a certain area, play that little mini game, whatever whatever tiles you're picking up. And then especially be able to activate your rondelle. Now, the rondelle is the activation portion of this that allows you to pick where you're going in the game. Now, the board version of Trajan is bland. It is flat. The chits are flat. They're not highly produced. The player board that has the rondelle and has these bowls, they're not bowls. They look like bowls from the picture, but they're just a boring print. This game needs to be an app. It would be outstanding. It brings Stefan Fell to such a broad audience. And it's just, you know, a great idea. And it's our number 10 
for this list alone. Yeah, I mean, one of the nicest things an app can do for you is take the uh, the burden of setting up and cleaning up the game off your head, and also the the addition involved in any step on Feld game, which just gets just so frustrating. So yeah. it's it's nice to have the computer handle that for you and remove that sort of barrier to entry. So. And I think it would give Stefan Fell's game a little bit more theme if there was some interactive computer, maybe cutscenes or things like that, because his game productions have been okay, but typically they've been a little bit light on theme and light on flavor, and this could give something more to it. All right, so now our number nine. It's going to be Glory to Rome. Now, Glory to Rome, once again, an outstanding Euro game. You're picking cards in order to build a tableau. You're going to have your special abilities. You're going to have your vault, which puts in your resources to score points. You're having, you know, a number of different buildings that come into play. and You're building their foundation. So basically, if you ever play Glory to Rome, you understand the idea of managing this massive chaos of cards around your tableau in the middle of the area that you're going to be pulling cards from. And then depending on how you turn the card, flip the card, activate the card, it's going to have a special ability. Great for a game. Really, really super fiddly. Now, an app version of this would allow you to, once you place your card in a certain area, whether it's the vault or it's going to be one of your active abilities in the game, It would be able to just show that one ability and what that resource card is being used for. Now, add on top of this the fact that Glory to Rome is out of print again. (sighs) This game needs to be played by a lot of people all the time. And the fact that it's it's not in print is, I don't know, it's it's something a cleric would probably say (laughs) to evil in that moment. It's just, it's an abomination. So... Glory to Rome is our number nine, and it needs to be out there because there needs to be that outreach, that outgrowth growth for bringing this game back to print. And it would also do something really interesting. Now, if you know the original Glory to Rome had this kind of cartoony artwork to it, and the later, more recent Kickstarter version had this almost clip art look to it, both are fine, both are playable, although the, you know, the card quality is not great. But with an app version, we could actually have either both, or we could have a brand new artwork here, which probably really is what Glory to Rome needs. All right, our number eight, Gravwell. Now, if only I knew someone who could talk about Gravwell. Is there anybody? I can't see. Is there someone around here? Hey, Daniel, you're here. Would you mind talking about Gravwell? I don't want to impose upon you, <laughs> but for this one circumstance, could I ask, could I plead with you to speak about Gravwell? At this moment, please, oh, for the fans, do it, man. Do it. Come on. Well, you know, I so rarely talk about Gravwell. It's not like I mention it maybe every third episode or anything as one of my favorite <laughs> games. I will point out, however, that you're the one who put this one on the list, which made me so happy <laughs> because now it looks less like I'm stalking the creator of Gravwell. Uh, anyway, you know, Gravwell is my favorite racing game, but it can be a little bit complex for new players to figure out exactly how uh, the various movement cards resolve themselves. And an app version could really do that very quickly uh, and help people get a feel for things. And on top of that, you could throw in some pretty fun little animations of ships spinning around in the void and that sort of thing, which would always be pretty cool. Uh, but I think it would be a great quick play in an app version. Yeah, for me, when I thought about what games would be great as an app, now oftentimes when you play you know, app board games, the board is so essential, especially if it's a Euro game, that there's all these little spots you have to go to. And if you're not playing on a tablet, it's really hard to see all these areas. So unless you, know, you can kind of minimize it or it can kind of pop up to you, you're kind of lost. Now, Gravwell has a really interesting, not artistically beautiful but the graphic design is really nice and it's understandable you kind of have this universe with this one track and that on a tablet or a phone is easily recognizable and to be able to see your cards maybe like move your you know your mouse or move your finger over a card and see the effect that would take place if it was played i think would help streamline this game a lot more because i think that The initial barrier for entry in this game is that most people are a little uncomfortable with trying to do the mathematic kind of calculations is, 
well, your your thing is th- your ship is three spots away, and this other ship is two spots. So if I go with gravity, is this going to happen or that's going to happen? And I think just at least initially having a kind of player aid here or an activation type of mechanic here would help this game a lot. Now, you'd have to be very careful to make sure they understood it was initial. Like, yes. this is how it would work if the field didn't change. Because what will happen a lot of times in Gravwell is someone will switch positions all of a sudden, and you're just going, Son of a... <laughs> crap! As you fling back to the center of the singularity. Um, but I do think that would be very helpful, yeah. So that's number eight? Yes. Gravwell. Yay! <laughs> Buy it. <laughs> All right, so our next game would be Tokaido. Now, Daniel gets really excited about this one, so I'm going to let him take this one. Yeah, so Tokaido was was one of my picks, uh, the first one so far. Uh, And it's just a beautiful game with a relatively simple board. You pick up a lot of little things as you're going on a a sort of pilgrimage along the the Tokaido, the the road in Japan upon which many people go on pilgrimages. Uh, And you're simply just trying to have the best time you could, right? Having a great road trip. Uh, And I think that it's, one, the the pieces are simple enough that they could really move to app very well. There wouldn't be any sort of impediment to that, and collecting sets would be easy, and you'd move those off to the side and that sort of thing. Uh, Two, I think it's got the same sort of simple map that you pointed out, Chris, right? It, it's very simple to see where you're going. The graphic design is very sure. clear, so it wouldn't be any problem with the screens. Uh, three, I think it's just an awesome game. So, you know, I'd like it to be an app because then it would be cheap, <laughs> presumably. Um, sure. Uh, but it's, it, I think it just translates pretty well. It's going to be a pretty clear movement-based game. As it is, it's already pretty simple on a board system. Um, so it doesn't have that whole, like, need to simplify. But you can even do things where, like, you know, when you go to the panoramic views, right, it just shows you the view on the screen, and, like, you <laughs> pan over it. I think it really capture the essence quite well. Okay, great. That was number seven, Takaido. All right, our number six game is Among the Stars. Now, Among the Stars, we talked about this previously. This was the tile drafting, tile placement Kind of a little bit of a tableau building because you're building your own space station that has special abilities kind of along the lines of Seven Wonders, but its own game in and of itself. So an app version of this would be interesting because we really haven't seen good implementations of a card drafting mechanic. Now, as Daniel talked earlier in the news, Seven Wonders coming out would be an outstanding idea. Now, to be able to draft tiles in that same type of way for Among the Stars would be a lot of fun too. And I think the one thing that Among the Stars is really missing that an app can do for it is the opportunity to see either cutscenes or tile animation because the artwork there is interesting. It's it's that kind of classic old sci-fi kind of world. And to be able to see a space station kind of locked together in pieces and maybe the pieces interact with people you know each other where maybe like little aliens would walk through the different sections or the power you know, would kind of run through the different section and kind of activate it, I think is a, is a mechanic that Among the Stars really does need because it does fall short on some ways as far as how the graphic design and the layout doesn't really look like a space station. It just looks like a, you know, a brick. Mm. So, you know, adding maybe a star field or, you know, some sort of special effects graphic and sound effects would really give that sci-fi theme to it. I think I actually really like the... Gra- uh... The Among the Stars graphic design. You would. I would. I do, in fact. <laughs> um, but I do think it would be made nicer by having sort of animations. Everything is, in a sense. Uh, the thing I was thinking about, actually, is with the power plants, sometimes people will lose track of exactly how far off they've gone, and the app can stop you from doing that. Sure. So it can prevent the accidental cheater. And there's really no situation in gaming for me that is more awkward than getting, you know, five or six rounds into gameplay and then someone goes oh wait you mean i couldn't do that because that was like the second thing i did and all of this depends upon me having done that so either you let me cheat or we just restart yeah uh and you know having an app there really would help prevent the accidental cheating which is you know sort of faultless yeah i'm sorry that happened to you you didn't understand the rules but crud, now the game is all out of order, right? It's all out of sorts. Sure. So. I hear you. That, that, that tends to be a problem with a lot of games, but I think that game more than any other game because 
once you're kind of locked into your mm. space station building, it's kind of hard to disassemble it and put it together in some other way. Yeah. yeah. Any, any sort of relative location uh, dependent uh, tile placement game gets really wonky about that. All right, so our number five is Robo Rally. Now, I put Robo Rally on the list because a couple of reasons. First off, you sh- as you hear with our list, a couple of things that we did not include. We didn't include dice rolling in our games. Now, the reason we did that is because dice rolling is fun, and that tactile sense of being able to throw down dice, see the randomization, is does not feel that right when you do it in a game. In an app version, when you click a button and the button kind of activates the dice, and you either see a number or the dice kind of does this phony type of roll to it, it doesn't really work really well. Or, when you're playing a game with miniatures. Now, miniatures have their own feel, their own texture, their own color. You can paint them. They're interactive. It's a lot of fun there. Robo Rally, while it does have its own little miniatures and does have its own randomness, one of the things that really comes to play really well in an app version is asymmetrical gameplay. So to be able to program your own actions, put the game on asymmetrical play, which means that somebody else can take their turn at a completely different time, and then once everyone has taken their turn, the action would take place is great because, honestly, this asymmetrical gameplay that's used in a lot of board games really should not be used. When you're playing an Agricola, when you're playing a Lords of Waterdeep, when you're playing these heavy Euro games, and you take a move, and then you you wait for the next player to take their move, and it's a day and a half later, you have now lost where you were in your strategy and your tactics, and you have to go, oh yeah, I think I was doing this, and I think he meant to do that. And you have to kind of replace yourself. But with Robo Rally, you are just choosing on your own, you know, irregardless of whatever what else you think everyone else is doing. And then you're leaving it alone. It happens. Their thing happens. It takes effect. You see where, you, where you're now at and you reprogram again. So in an asymmetrical format that the apps tend to play, Robo Rally really works well. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I hate Robo Rally with a passion. But I think I would hate it less as an app. <laughs> yeah. So there's something to that. The idea that the, the programming would go faster, yeah. play would move quicker. Part of what I hated about it was people go, wait, wait, well, wait, I'm on the, and then this, and I spin, but I'm on this little thingy, and then he pushed me, and just having the computer do that might make the game move much more smoothly. Yeah, I think, I think like you're saying, Daniel, this game needs to be a fast-playing game, and in practice it's not. No. And, I, and I, it happens because AP really cripples people. And honestly, <laughs> some hands of Robo Rally, I'm like, all right, just screw it. I'm just going to throw anything together and see what happens. And sometimes that works out just as well because of the randomness of gameplay here. So you go have your AP in your own little corner. I've already programmed my moves. It'll let me know when it's ready to activate. And we're fine. And it's fast. And another thing, too, about Robo Rally, it's expensive, and basically, it's expensive because you're buying all these boards. Robo Rally, our number five. All right, our number four game is the number two top game in Board Game Geeks Top 100, Terra Mystica. Now, the reason why I picked this Euro game here is because there are so many elements to this game that, while it's a great game, don't make it a great game. So, for example, the components in Terra Mystica are just generic Catan components. You really don't need to be moving or playing or looking at these components. There's nothing really interesting there. Second, the board. The board really isn't interesting. It's that standard kind of hex map there. Nothing really interesting here. Your player board really is where almost everything takes place. So if you have this on a tablet or you have this on a phone, you have this one spot where all your actions take place. You can do that there. Then you can jump to the board where you will terraform those different areas. And I think by being on an app, you can change or choose different components, and you could see that te- the terraforming could have some sort of animation or sound or effect that might bring a little more theme into this very dry Euro game. It's a great game, don't get me wrong, love Terra Mystica, but it definitely needs something, a component upgrade, or some more theming to it. So... For this, I think the app gives you that special ability to kind of bring some more flavor and sound into it. All right, so that's our number four, Terra Mystica. Now on to our top three. Our number three is Smash Up, a hopefully play deck version of Smash Up. 
Well, so yeah, Playdeck announced Smash Up a long, long time ago, and then stopped announcing <laughs> Smash Up. I don't think they so much canceled it as they just stopped talking about it. And, you know, I kind of want to know where that went. Smash Up is a great game. It seems like it would be easy to make into an app because of the way it plays, right? Sure. It's, it's all about putting these decks together and playing them out to burst these, you know, hit a certain number of points on each uh, base. Uh, one thing that'd be nice is if you wanted to, you could even let people use the same decks, right? So that you wouldn't have to be, oh, they chose aliens, I don't get aliens. Or you could keep it to the rules of the, the card game, which I actually would prefer to get more variety out there. But, you know, not everybody's me. For what, you know, <laughs> that's too bad for them, but because I'm pretty awesome, guys. Pretty awesome. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think Smash Up is long overdue. Play Deck owes us. They made promises. <laughs> it's time to fulfill. We wouldn't want to smash it up, huh? <laughs> ah. ah, puns. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our number two game is Dead of Winter. Now, there is some app, you know, companion app that's in the works for Dead of Winter, but once again, this is another game that would really benefit from an upgrade component wise because you got a lot of these kind of flat you know, standees that really don't, don't do much for you. And if you have a zombie game, you want to feel the fact that you're being overwhelmed. So when you play the game, it's like, yes, there's zombies, you know, s- surrounding us. But if I look from a different angle, they're not there at all. Because <laughs> they're so thin and they're so not interactive. Plus, when you play Dead of Winter, since you're getting these different characters, since you have your own special end win game type of condition... There is some work that you really want to kind of, you know, do on your own away from everybody else. And if you're kind of shuffling through your cards trying to figure out if you have enough food or what to play or double check your final goals or, you know, you're kind of giving away some of your strategy or tactics or what your final goal might be or if you might be the traitor in this game. So... An app version of this, and I would say that an app version should include a tablet collaboration where maybe, just maybe, you could put the tablet in the middle to be the board, and then you could have your phone to be your own little personal diary and player area where you can control your own little you know, players in the game. Because a phone alone or a tablet alone wouldn't work here, but a tablet with a phone that everyone would have would work great. Yeah, I mean, it's a high bar to set because that is a lot of gear at the table. If nothing else, that's a several thousand dollar version of Dead of Winter. (laughs) But it would be really cool. And Dead Um, of Winter deserves it because it's a really cool game. Yeah, and I I think it would be interesting. It's it's got a challenge that a lot of these other games don't have that it's it's very complex compared to them. Uh, But I think it's surmountable, a surmountable challenge. Yeah, I just think giving Dead of Winter access to a larger audience because... It is an expensive game. It is a very niche game. It's coming from a small publisher, Plat Hat. And I'd like this game to get out to more people because for me, it does co-op and especially semi-co-op, you know, such a great service. I mean, it's, it's probably the best semi-co-op game out there now. And, you know, people are really interested in zombie stuff, as we heard earlier, even nerfing the cleric, but all right. Um, People love zombies. So to have a zombie game out there like Dead of Winter would bring in so many people to the hobby. And we really need to do that. And there's just not enough physical copies of Dead of Winter to bring all those fans in. And our number one pick for the best board game that should be an app... GD Mages. All right. Hold on. Hold on. We didn't say best game. We said best game that could be an outstanding, outrageous, tons of fun, and other superlatives. Hold on a second. This is the source around here somewhere, right? <laughs> so our number one pick is Chitty Mages. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. First off is you probably don't know what Chitty Mages is. Now, hopefully you've listened to one of our podcasts where Chitty Mages was one of the feature reviews. Now, Cheaty Mages is a small game. I wouldn't say that it's a micro game. No, I think it's got a little too many pieces rolling around in there and a little too much complexity. I mean, it's not a complicated game. Sure. But there are lots of little kits and stuff, right? All the money and that sort of thing. It's, I don't know, it it might, it's on the border. It's, It's a light game. It's a thematic game. 
It's a... I know Daniel doesn't like this term. It's an Ameritrash game? Uh-oh. He's glaring at me. You can't see this, but he's... Oh. I, I'm using Americlash. Americlash game. Americlash, right? So the whole thing is... Ameri- like They're like about being competitive and aggressive, and that way people aren't making fun of the games I like. Jerks. <laughs> Remember your clericness. St- stuck up Euros. Remember your clericness. <laughs> <laughs> your clericness. You have no power here. <laughs> we have bits and pieces. You cannot affect them. So... Back to <laughs> back to Cheaty Mages. All right. So Cheaty Mages is a competition betting game, kind of like think Harry Potter, you know, Quidditch, where you have competitors in play, but you don't own or you're not a competitor in play, but you are one of the people that are wagering on the competitors in play. So it's it's got that fantasy element to it where there's a dragon and there's a troll and there's a vampire and there's a succubus and they're competing now what you get to do as a wizard in a cheating type of way is to play magical spells to benefit and to let's say hinder other competitors because when the game starts you are going to wager secretly on one of the characters or on multiple of the characters in the game And depending on first, second, third, and such, depending on who wins that competition, you will score money. So you might want to wager on one and put all your money in that one person and get the biggest benefit. Or you might want to spread it out a little bit and win a little bit each. So what would be great here is, once again, I know this is an expensive thing to do, but either if you had a tablet in the middle and a separate phone, so you had your own little betting type of sheet and cards here... Or this game would also play well just, you know, on a phone. And that's really the, the one thing that we're looking for here. A lot of these games would require a large investment as far as having an app or having the most up-to-date phone possible. But Cheaty Mages is a game that's fun. It's light. It plays with a lot of people. It's very thematic. It's got a lot of possibilities to it. It has that Harry Potter kind of feel to it. So it would bring a lot of fans into the industry. And yet, playing spells on it, you know, on an app is pretty simple. The artwork is a little basic and maybe an app could update that. And you could have animation popping out from these cards and making it an outstanding game. Yeah, I mean, the thing that made this really stick out to me is the idea of having the spells animated and the battle sequence unfold. So, you know, you're walking on your phone, you do all your betting and stuff, and you hit done, and everyone else hits done, and then... And then you get to watch as the dragon gets shrunken, (laughs) enlarged, caught on fire, grows an extra set of wings, that sort of thing. Uh, Yeah, and it's definitely one of those games that really does need a graphical update. It's really got a very basic type of look. It's, It's not a bad game as far as that's concerned, but... It really could use something just a little bit more. And as we all know, Sage of Kanai does a great job of bringing gateway entry-level gamers into play in that classic kind of Japanese artwork that was, that's was that been brought over like you've seen in the early editions of Love Letter and Chronicle. So, fun game. Something that really needs to be an app. Sage, get on this, man. We really need to have this so we can bring it out to new people and honestly, I want to play something quick. I want to play something fun. I want to play something with the whole family. And I want to play something that really benefits from the technology that apps and tablets bring into play. Yeah, I think that'll be a good choice. So that's our top 10 games that could be really good apps. All right, so that's everything for this week. In the meantime, check us out on all of our social media outlets, including Twitter, Facebook, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek, and especially our Patreon account that keeps us going to bring you a brand new podcast each and every week. Until then, this is Chris. And this is Daniel. And until next time, we'll save you a virtual seat at the tablet.